Um, I've already disclosed, of course, who I am, so we can uh, skip through this part very quickly. The subject at hand is traditional versus microbiological periodontal disease assessment. But before I talk about the particulars of that, I want to remind you all about why patients go to the dentist, according to the latest statistics that I have access to. The little red slice that you see on the uh, chart there is the number of people who go either for a periodontal problem or a bleeding problem on their gums, according to the ADA phone survey in 2002. All of the other things, fillings, checkups, and so forth, you'd expect to be on there. But that little slice is actually smaller than 1% of people presenting for therapy. And yet we know that a great many more people have uh, periodontal problems than 1%. According to um, therapy records that are uh, out with the insurance companies, about 3% of all insurance codes made to the insurance companies are for perio-related codes as opposed to restorative and examination codes. That's not too dissimilar from the number of patients that are presenting for periodontal problems. So neither the public nor the profession at large is doing very much to diagnose perio, and yet we know that it's rampant in the community. Why so? Well, Listerine, of course. They advertise so much along with other mouthwash products. It's not unexpected that patients think that this product is going to cure all of their periodontal problems. They're being told that use this and you know all these things go away, you're going to be healthy, why bother going to a dentist for it? Many patients do not recognize the significant systemic risks of having periodontal disease. We'll talk about that in just a moment. And for a lot of offices, perio isn't viewed as a profit center. They're viewed as a loss leader within their practices, something to be done to keep the patients coming in every six months for cleaning while you do the real work. Time taken away from the real work to do the perio. And also GPs have relatively little training in the area of periodontics during their four-year dental curriculum. Also, unfortunately, a lot of periodontists constantly reinforce that fact to their referring GPs that, you know, they know all about perio, GPs don't, therefore anything that bleeds or has a pocket deeper than four millimeters, you should refer to me. So that tends to keep GPs ignorant in the area of perio. Systemic effects, most of you are well familiar with these. I don't have to go over these in any detail at all. But suffice it to say that a large number of significant life-threatening medical diseases have now been linked to periodontal disease. We don't know for sure if it's the periodontal disease that is actually causing the medical diseases. Maybe that they share some other factors, such as a lifestyle or diet or whatever. But the evidence is mounting and, and in my opinion, getting near to be conclusive, including a number of, of cancers. Uh, the incidence of lung cancer, kidney cancer, pancreatic cancer, leukemias and myelomas all increase significantly if the patient also has periodontal disease. This is fascinating to me. Uh, the American Academy of Dental Schools keeps track of these numbers. So these are the undergraduate, before you get your dental degree, clock hours spent uh, in a, in a four-year curriculum, which is about 5,000 hours. It turns out that just 310 hours on average, some schools more, some less, are spent in the area of periodontics. Well, no wonder that when a, when a dentist is turned out in, into practice, he doesn't necessarily feel confident in his skills in perio. He's done comparatively little but compared to all the other procedures that he's done in his training. Most surveys that accept the two millimeter or more attachment loss as the standard of disease will come up with a figure of three quarters of the population having some form of periodontal disease. Some surveys say more, some less, and the variance is how deep a loss of attachment they use as the criteria. But the NHANES and other studies two millimeters or more of attachment. Why is a disease like that so widespread in the population? The common colds aren't that widespread. You know, seven out of 10 people don't have a cold at any given time, but likely they do have some form of periodontal disease. Well, it's easily transmitted, both vertically from parent to children, and also side to side transmission, probably through kissing and saliva as the vector. What are the differences microbiologically between healthy patients and periodontally involved patients. Healthy samples tend to be high in non-modal bacteria and coital forms. Disease samples tend to be much higher in species that are highly modal within the sample, particularly spirochetes and gliding rods as they're described. 
Non disease associated biofilms tend to be gram positive, disease associated biofilms, gram negative. Healthy ones, aerobic, and disease associated ones, anaerobic. And I want to redefine the term because it's come into misuse for finding. In the microbiological community, anaerobic, aerobic refers to the optimal growth conditions of a bug, not necessarily to what kills the bug. Most of these uh, organisms are relatively tolerant of, of oxygen, aerobic conditions. They have to be in order to survive transmission from one host to another. Their growth rate is depressed, however, when the high oxygen conditions are present. So when you're choosing your antimicrobial agents, bear that in mind. It's a, it's a, it's a time-dependent exposure to the oxygen that is very important. And lastly, white blood cells. This is the body's inflammatory cell. You would expect to find a high number of them in people who are periodontally bald, and in fact you do, and a uh, few of them present in disease. So these are all key factors that you can look at with microbiological tests that have been brought to the market. Uh, some of the prominent microflora that you see in periodontitis. The top three the so-called red group that were nicknamed that by Sikransky based on the frequency of association of those bugs with periodontal disease. So you'll see that mentioned in the literature all the time now, the red group. That's P. gingivalis, T. forsythus, and Treponema species all together, of which there are 57. How do biofilms form? And biofilm really is the proper word for it. Uh, the term plaque is, is, a, is a non-descriptive, non-specific entity that existed 60 years ago, we didn't know much about the biology of plaques. Today we do, and we talk about them as biofilms, and they're rampant in nature. Any place water comes into contact with a surface, biofilms can film, and they exploit that environment, no less so in the mouth. Initially, when the host is infected, these microorganisms are planktonic, they're free swimmers. Once they encounter a substrate, they switch on genes within their uh, genome that adapts them for clinging to those surfaces, and they begin attaching and building up more and more complex societies. Biofilms are almost never one species of organism. They are a, a multi-conglomerate of organisms that are cooperating together in order to form these complex communities. They almost act like a tissue in that some of the species will specialize in one particular job while others will specialize in another, say, say protecting the ones uh, more interior to the biofilm, uh, helping move fluids within them. Uh, it's, it's complex, and, and every day we seem to be finding more and more. Uh, some bacteria will actually switch on genes in other species, something that you know, was, was thought impossible years ago, now is commonly observed. So they will actually upregulate genes in adjacent species in order to favor themselves and complex interdependencies develop because of that. Second phase is the growth phase. Once the biofilm has been established, rapid growth occurs. It builds up both laterally and vertically in the community. And significantly, intact biofilms can be up to 1,500 times more resistant to systemic antibiotics than planktonic forms of the same bacteria because of the specialization and, and role play that they do once they're members of the biofilm community. So this is fundamentally important in terms of how you choose to deal with these infections subsequently because if you don't mechanically disrupt that biofilm in some fashion, it's going to be much harder for systemic antibiotics if you choose to use those to work. This is a better artist illustration of how biofilms colonize and grow, more graphic for you. Now, I have some um, little movies here for you. This was a, uh, a photomicrograph of particles moving through a biofilm, and you'll notice that there are channels where nutrients come and waste products are dumped. It's very analogous to, to a city that's growing on a, a river. That's where early colonists tend to put their cities because they got a constant flow of fresh water and a way to get rid of all their waste products. No different than biofilms. And some of those species specialize in this transport system within the biofilms. Biofilms move on their own. Uh, two forces propel that. One is the physical growth and the mass of the biofilm. The other is the shear forces uh, associated with the curricular fluid flow. These guys don't exist in a vacuum. They exist on a surface that is being flushed, albeit slowly, 
with curricular fluids, and that helps spread the biofilms as well. Here is a mini movie, highly magnified at a single biofilm community, and you can see the shear forces. Once it reaches a certain growth uh, maximum, daughter colonies shear off and then are spread by the curricular fluids to other sites. And we're trapped in this film forever. Okay. How fast do bacteria grow? Interesting question. Turns out, research uh, that Dr. Walter Loesch did, it was a thought experiment. No one's figured out a way to directly measure it. But uh, via calculations, it turns out to be about 4.8 hours. About every five hours, the number of bacteria in one's mouth doubles, absent hygiene, of course. So that uh, is an impressive number to take home to your patients. You know, that's why you have to do daily oral hygiene care. If you go 24 hours without interrupting the process, that's now two to the fifth new generations of bacteria, five in the 24. Contrary to popular belief, the bacteria themselves do relatively little damage to the periodontia. It would require many orders of magnitude more bacteria to account for the physical damage that we see. What happens is more analogous to uh, autoimmune diseases. These bacteria trigger immunological defenses on the part of the body, and it is those defenses that wind up damaging the tissue in two phases. One is a passive phase where the white blood cells are delivered to the site. They have a three-day lifespan. They die if they haven't used up their, their uh, enzymes and killing bacteria, which they don't. So about half of the destruction comes from the in situ death of our own white blood cells, releasing those enzymes directly on the cell with our tissues they're designed to protect. The other half of the destruction is an active enzymatic pathway. The body is saying, basically, I don't care how many white blood cells were sent to the site of the battle. Uh, they're winning. We need more white blood cells. How do you get more white blood cells to a tissue? You enlarge the vascular network. You, you build more capillaries. In order to do that, you have to break down existing tissue, so the body begins uh, putting out catalases and osteoclases and other mechanisms to physically break down the attachment apparatus to, uh, to provide the room for a denser capillary network to get more of the infection-fighting cells to the, to the area of, of damage. So the bacteria, not so much our own immune systems, yes, and you have to conceptualize periodontal diseases just as the way with other autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and uh, uh, diabetes, type 1 diabetes. Altogether, there are about 40 known autoimmune diseases, and they all have similar mechanisms of destruction. So quickly covering my, my introductory remarks here, it's biofilm, not plaque. All biofilms are not pathogenic. It depends on which microorganisms are in those biofilms that can trigger an immunological response to them. Periodontal disease is a microbial infection, but it's inflammation that is doing the actual damage. And of course, there are severe medical threats to having periodontal disease. And disease biofilms and health-associated biofilms are distinctly microbiologically different. Now, armed with that knowledge, how are you going to assess patients who are at periodontal risk? Can the traditional tests, radiographs, bleeding on probing, periodontal pocket bath, assess who it is not infected with pathogenic strains? Clearly, the answer is not. Isn't it time we move beyond a notched metal stick as the primary diagnostic tool of dentistry? I mean, this is, this is like, you know, caveman dentistry. Consider this also. We know from the statistics I just showed you that only about 1% of patients are presenting because of periodontal diseases. But for every 1,000 people in a population, 145 are going to have severe periodontal disease. Another 228 are going to have incipient periodontal disease. For a total of about a third of that 1,000 people, a third of, of the patients in any given population block are either going to have periodontal disease factual or early periodontal disease. And I challenge you with the question, are you getting those sorts of diagnostic capture rates among your patients now? Are you finding you know, a third of your patients you know, with infections? Because statistically, that's what they should be. Unless, of course, you're already doing a lot of these things. 
Let's go over the old tests, what I call the legacy tests. These are our tests that have been passed down to us and we use them principally because we've been taught to use them. The scientific evidence for them is poor. Disclosing solutions, radiographs, bleeding on probing, and pocket depth measurements. First of all, disclosing solutions. What are you disclosing? You're disclosing super gingival plaques, to use the old-fashioned word. Those are going to be aerobic. They are not going to be disease associated species in it to any great degree. It's, it's unimportant which bacteria are in the supergenital plaques. Those aren't the ones that trigger the immunological reactions. As a motivational tool, yes, disclosing solution you know, can have a strong effect on the patient seeing it. But the level of staining is not related to the level of pathogenicity. Radiographs. Radiographs, of course, are a post hoc measurement. You're measuring damage to the bone after and has been destroyed and lost. So it's a lagging indicator. That's not good as a diagnostic tool. One exception, an intact lamina dura, uh, work by Rams has showed that if an intact lamina dura is in place, that there is a, a safety window of about a year before you would see any additional bony breakdown in those sites. The pocket is not the disease. That is an artifact caused by the disease, and yet we tend to uh, conflate the two and confuse one for the other. Think, shallow sites are not protective. We all start off with shallow sulcus in our mouths, right? I mean, when you're you know, 13 years old, you know, healthy and you know, vigorous, shallow pockets are the rule. But somehow, those shallow pockets become deep pockets, so the risk is in the shallow pockets, and periodontal probing gives you no way to assess that. But a pathogenic microflora can establish in those shallow sites and trigger the immunological reactions that lead to disease. Conversely, deep pockets are not necessarily diseased in the microbiological sense. That may be historical damage to that site. The current microflora in those sites may in fact be healthy. The existing tools that we've used, these legacy tests of bleeding and pocket depth, cannot distinguish those things. Bleeding on probing. Boy, when I talk to hygiene audiences, <laughs> This, this one, you know, this sharpen the knives. The hygienists just cannot accept that bleeding on probing is, is a bad indicator for measuring who's at periodontal risk. But studies, many studies at this point in time, have compared bleeding at baseline and subsequent in the measuring uh, scheme, and they're not finding any correlation with who bleeds and who does not bleed with future loss of attachment. They are sometimes related, sometimes not. So, so you get some cases where, yeah, it seems to be distinctly related, and it may be. The problem is that there are a host of confounding factors that can also cause bleeding that is not related to periodontal disease. And how do you distinguish one from the other? For instance, I think we've got the list here, probing force. The ideal probing force is 20 to 30 grams of weight. Want to guess how much a periodontal probe weighs if you put it on a gram balance? 20 to 30 grams. And how many of you just let that probe sit in the pocket on its own weight and measure the depth? You all apply additional pressure. That's what you're taught to do. Any additional pressure, by definition, is overpressure. Because now you're probing more than the weight of the 20 gram probe, so you're probing too hard, and that obviously is going to induce uh, more bleeding. If you're going to probe, which unfortunately you have to because it's the law in most states, get yourself the best possible mechanical probe you can, like a Florida probe or, or a force actuated probe. Drugs and hormones, about, uh, golly, what was the last statistic I saw? I think it was about 30% of the adult population is now on hypertensive medications. Guess what they all do as a class of drugs? They increase capillary fragility. So those patients are going to bleed much more readily on probing than a person who is not on those particular drugs, independent of whether or not they have periodontal disease. Aspirin, we would throw in that category too. Most, uh, a lot, I don't know what the percentage is, but physicians have been telling adults for years now, taking aspirin a day as a prophylactic measure, and aspirin will increase the propensity to bleed on probing as well. And there's what I like to call heroic hygiene. This is, you know, the patient's attempt the night before they come see you to convince you that, you know, they've been doing this for the last six months, <laughs> when in fact they haven't. But that will induce bleeding on probing the next day too, just from the mechanical trauma of going in on those tissues that haven't been regularly uh, treat it. This one's a subtle one, unconscious expectations. You look on the patient's chart 
And you note that there was a five millimeter pocket there in the last visit. So you probe with the unconscious expectation of finding that five millimeter probe pocket, whether or not it's there or not. You know, it's a self-justifying philosophy. And you don't think that, you know, gee, I'm gonna probe harder to see if that five millimeter pocket are there. It's just an, a natural human thing that we do. So an unbiased probing would have no prior knowledge of the pocket depths on that patient's record. I mentioned common drug effects, 25%. It's close. Oh, that will take aspirin a daily. That increases by itself, bleeding by over 12%. Oral contraceptives, same thing. And here's, here's the real nail in the coffin on bleeding on probing. When you look at all the studies and you compare the relative rates of false positive to false negatives, you find that you get a false positive. In other words, there's bleeding on probing that is not caused by periodontal disease about 29% of the time. That's one out of three patients bleeds but is not diseased. False negative though, probability that they, disease, that they have disease when there is no bleeding, almost 90%. So as, as a scientific measure of, of who in, is and is not at risk of periodontal disease, bleeding is a miserable failure. Nine out of 10 times when it doesn't bleed, they are infected. And a third of the time when they bleed, they don't have disease. That's just unacceptable as, as a diagnostic parameter. I mentioned that pockets are the result, not the cause of the disease. I should take that slide out to save time. Also, measurement error is a big problem with probing. The Academy of Periodontology says that the change in probing depth over a one year period, or well, from one visit to another rather, has to be at least two millimeters to be statistically significant. Clinicians have a hard time accepting this. I've never met any clinician that says, you know, all these statistics apply to other guys, other girls. You know, it's not me. I probe well. Those those morons out there, you know, besides me, they're the ones, you know, who are probing too hard or probing at the wrong angle or incorrectly. But these are cumulative data. These are on, on, on bodies of dentists. They are average and we're all subject to these sorts of statistics. You cannot accurately measure a pocket depth with a millimeter probe. What if, for instance, instead of millimeter markings on your periodontal probe, we marked them in half millimeter markings? Would that make the probe twice as accurate as a scientific instrument? Well, clearly not. Uh, the, the markings on the probe are, are immaterial. In, in order to get over what are called the standard deviation of error of the means, you have to have a change of at least two millimeters for that change that you can measure with your hand and that little notched metal stick to be statistically significant. And that basically says the same thing. So, points I've covered so far on the legacy tests for periodontal disease are highly advanced 20th century dentistry. We're using a notched metal stick and seeing or not whether we can get the patient to bleed or not. These tests are not diagnostic. They are lagging indicators. Sometimes they're simply false indicators, as in the false positive and negatives on the bleeding probes. Let me skip ahead here because I know we're pressed for time. The diagnostic consequences of this are, are profound because if we only measure bleeding and pocket depth as the criteria for who is, is not a disease, that's the thing that's going to get treated. If you're measuring pockets, you're going to be treating pockets. But the pocket is not the disease, it's an artifact. If you're measuring bleeding, you're going to be measuring, you're treating, get that patient to stop bleeding. But the bleeding may not be caused by the disease, it could be caused by a number of other confounding factors. So what you measure is what you're likely going to be treating. So you want to get yourself a better yardstick, a more precise and more scientifically valid yardstick if you're going to be detecting periodontal disease and treating it subsequently. Uh, I'm meant to skip this slide because we have so little time. Uh, here we are, 30 years after the promulgation of the specific plaque hypothesis, which says that particular species of bacteria cause disease and others do not. So we know there's a microbiological differences. Most practices are still trying to find out whether they're diseased with notch sticks and blood. 
Why is that more true in dentistry than in medicine? Medicine has embraced microbiological testing. Maybe it's just tradition, you know. That's what I was taught to do in school. School, that's the last place things get introduced into practice, you know. The, most people when they come out of school are a little on the backward side to, compared to cutting edge technology. The knowledge is out there, the journals are out there, the science is out there. Uh, microbiology is where it's at. So, what tests do we have available for you today if you want to become a better diagnostician? And there are five currently available. First, on the market was Cultures, and there are two laboratories that do that. I'll show you their names in a second. These are outside laboratories that have anaerobic growth chambers where they can culture out uh, representative uh, species that are associated with disease. micro IDEF is a DNA test. It's also an outside laboratory test. You take your sample in the office, send it out, and they will tell you whether a range of species are present in that sample that are disease associated. Genotype is now uh, off the market, but a, a new test is coming on the market for that. Bana enzyme. This is a, uh, a chair site microbiological test that was developed at the University of Michigan that looks for an enzyme that is unique to those three members of the red group that I showed you, Sikransky's red group. Turns out that they possess a unique peptide, and you can base a test around the presence of that peptide. And lastly, phase contrast microscopy, uh, which is, again, a chair site method of looking at a number of morphological risk types and at the white blood cell populations on those patients. White blood cells are going to go up when you have inflammatory disease. We can see that with a microscope. Individually, what are the advantages and disadvantages of culturing? No test is perfect. They're all going to have some pluses, some minuses, and you can pick and choose them for you know, the, the application you want. Many offices nowadays use more than one test in their office, so they have confirming tests that uh, rule out the possibility of, of error better. Uh, cultures can speciate. They can tell you exactly what the genus and species of the bugs are. They can uh, test for multiple species. I believe the various labs will typically test for about someplace 8 to 12 microorganisms. Dr. Jurgen Slotz, who is the speaker following me, runs one of the labs out at uh, USC, and I'm sure he can tell you with greater exactitude than I can exactly what species they test for. Anaerobic sensitivity, antibiotic sensitivity rather. Uh, at the same time that they culture out the bugs that are in the sample that you send, they plate them out against uh, antibiotics. And they can tell you whether or not those particular bugs that your patient has are susceptible to which antibiotics. So you can pick exactly the best one rather than shotgunning and experimenting, you know, with, does this one work or does that one work? You'll know before you start. They can tell you the relative proportions of the bugs that are there. Disadvantages, it does take some time. It, it, you have to send it to the lab. Some of these bugs just don't culture well unless you leave them growing for about two weeks. So it, it requires at least that. Uh, in warm weather, they recommend that you ship it overnight because of the uh, temperature sensitivities. Cost per test is about $120 the last I checked. And some pathogens can't be cultivated. But most of these laboratories do backup tests besides the culture either a DNA or a microscopy or some other one to, to validate the, the results that they're getting with the primary test of culture. Here are the two culturing services. Uh, OMTS is in Philadelphia, Temple University. It's run by Dr. Tom Rams there. Uh, the other laboratory that I recommend, OMTL, that's located in Los Angeles at USC. Dr. Jurgen Slotz is the director of the laboratory there, at least last I knew. Where are you going to get your samples from? This makes a difference. Uh, I mentioned with the supergingival plaques, those are going to be largely aerobic and not disease associated. So you want to get your sample from the apical third of the pocket if possible. That is going to be the most anaerobic portion of the biofilm in that pocket. And that's going to be the most diseased of the flora if there is going to be one there. So that's what you want to look for. The DNA testing. Advantages there, they test just for the three members of the red group. Also eight additional pathogens in addition to those red group members. So you get the, the worst offenders plus a selection of other uh, often encountered periodontal pathogens. They can infer antibiotic sensitivity based on the literature. They don't actually test it against antibiotic plates though. Uh, and they get you really nice patient documentation which I'll show you on the next slide. And also, again, it's an outside lab, so you have somebody else verifying your clinical findings. 
disadvantages. It has to be sent off to a reference lab. It's going to take four to ten days, depending on where you are. The cost on these is $89. Microident, here is the chart that you get. Uh, it's computer printed out, and I've got a pointer with me someplace. Well, I've got it outlined electronically, I think. The jagged red line that you see going horizontally, that is the antibiotic threshold. So when a particular species is above that, as you see in the first column there, that would be a patient that probably needs antibiotic because the levels of the infecting organism are so high. If it's anywhere above that bottom blue line, that means that they are present. If you don't see any column above that blue line, the organism is totally absent in the sample. And in this particular sample, we have four species of bacteria that are above the systemic antibiotic line. So this patient may be a good candidate for systemic antibiotic in the initial therapy. This is what the gizmo looks like. It's about the size of two cigarette packs. So it's very small. Put it right on your counter. It uses a test strip, and I'll walk you through the, uh, the process here. Five minutes processing to get your results. The cost of the gizmo is $400. The cost of each test strip is $6. And here's how you do it. You, you get your subgingival sample. You wipe it gently on the lower half of the test strip, usually from more than one pocket. You, you want to average these out so that you're not sampling the only healthy pocket that might be in that patient's mouth. Sample the three deepest of record. Smear it onto the lower test strip. Don't scrub it because the enzyme is on the, the test strip. You moisten the upper half with a little bit of distilled water fold it at the perforation, and then it gets inserted into a slot on the testing apparatus. This was the first generation of the testing apparatus, much larger. Once you do that, it starts an automatic timing cycle that heats the sample at a particular temperature for five minutes. In effect, incubates the reaction on the test strip. Uh, five minutes later, a little light and bell lets you know it's finished. You pull the test strip out throw off the lower half, and the result will be on the upper half, a color change. Uh, the color change will go from a light gray to a, I got a bigger uh, blow up of that here, yeah. Sometimes this doesn't project well. well it's better than most here. Uh, on the left, left side column, that would be a negative test where there's no color change at all. If you get a light gray uh, detectable change in the color, uh, that would be a weakly positive test, meaning that Yes, it's positive for one of those three species of bacteria, but not in large numbers. If you get strong and the, and the spots move from gray towards blue, or you see them in, in much more surface area covered on there, that would be a strongly positive result, meaning that the, the test species are present and in very large numbers. So it's a semi-quantitative test for the three bacteria most highly associated with periodontal disease. Time. Uh, this was the very first microscope. This, I probably should have left this out for time purposes, but I think it's neat. Uh, Jensen, 100 years before Van Leeuwenhoek, in, actually invented the first microscope. This was Van Leeuwenhoek's microscope. Considerably more primitive looking, but actually magnified more, so that's why he got the credit for it. The actual microscope part was a little glass bead on the left-hand upper side there, and you would stick your sample onto the onto the fully adjustable stage, that turn crank there, and hold the thing up to the light so the light would come through that little glass bead. And you didn't like looking through a glass of water, you know, you see things magnified a little bit. What's interesting about Van Leeuwenhoek is that he actually looked at his own dental plaques, first person to observe it in the literature. And he described the little living animalcules that he saw moving within the dental plaques. And in his day, a popular remedy for halitosis was to uh, rinse your mouth out with vinegar. And he described in his notebooks how the animalcules fell dead forthwith when you rinsed with the vinegar. So he's actually also the first observer of a chemotherapeutic effect in treating the oral microflora. All of this is in much more detail uh, if you want to download the program from the IEOMT website or if you want to pick up your own private disc of it at our booth. Free of charge, by the way. We're not charging anything for that. And that will be the full version, the, the two-hour version of this talk. Advantages of microscopy, it's chair side, it's very fast, two minutes to mount and see your results. The instrument is expensive, but the tests are, are very cheap, cost you $25 per test, it's just a little bit of glassware. 
Uh, we can look at the morphotypes that are associated with disease, like the whole species of the, uh, the spirochete family. Uh, they're all highly distinctive under a microscope. We can look for the white blood cells, the inflammatory cell, and make an educated guess as to whether this site is inflamed or not based on that. And it can also pick up protozoans. Uh, there, there's a difference of opinion among people as to how, how involved in the disease process the protozoans are. But regardless of which way you fall on that issue, they are observable with a microscope. And as far as I know, none of the other tests will look for protozoans. Patient motivation, that's, that's hands down the best way to motivate a patient to start doing their home care or to get onto your treatment program. When they see their own bugs live in motion and they came from their mouth and they're seeing it, if they don't want to cooperate with a treatment program, they're never going to. And you don't have to be a microbiologist to see that the one on the left is quite a bit different than the one on the right. You don't have to know what's in there. Uh, from a microbiological point of view, there's a distinct difference. And patients pick up on that pretty rapidly. So for patient motivation, chair side microscopy is also very, very effective. It has disadvantages. The first one, of course, being the price of the gizmo. Uh, they cost between five to $7,000 in their various configurations. Uh, it will not tell you what antibiotic to use when you do the test. There's no way for it to determine that. It's kind of an unfamiliar technology to most people. They're not very hard to use, but it's something you have to learn how to do if you haven't used the microscope before. Here's the actual procedure. You take a slide. Place a drop of mounting fluid. It turns out the, the salinity of the mounting fluid makes a, a big difference in what you're likely to see, so we provide a uh, balanced solution with it. It's kind of an artificial curricular fluid, if you will. And then you take your sample and tease it into the drop of the oroprep on the side, gently. You don't want to mix master it up because there's some information to be had by the structure of the biofilms, the, the way they're organized on the slide as well. Pool them from multiple sites into the same drop is common. Then a cover glass is placed onto the sample and just drop down, touch one edge first, traps less air bubbles than if you drop it flat. Compress the sample. Not hard, just enough to blanch your fingernail if you're pressing on a finger. And the last is to seal it. It turns out that the best time, this is an accidental observation, to view these samples was about 20 minutes after they're first prepared. We speculate that the thermal and mechanical shock of taking them out of their nice warm biofilm in the mouth and slapping them on to them, a cold slide uh, in different conditions temporarily disrupts a lot of their processes, but they seem to get over it because 20 minutes later they're moving around much more rapidly, and we know on average it takes them about five hours to reproduce, it's just not that they're reproducing on the slide. But in order to keep them alive for the 20 minutes, you have to seal the slide, otherwise it will dry out and desiccate within five minutes. So sealing them is the last step, and you just paint a uh, thin film of the ore seal along all four edges of the cover glass. Risk factors, we can pick up the whole genus of the spirochetes, the treponemes, 57 species. You can pick up yeast, yeast in the literature all by themselves in the absence of any other microbial species can trigger an inflammatory process. And often you see these after patients have been heavy handed treated with a systemic antibiotic, for instance. You wipe out all the competing microflora and turn yeast into a super infector. Trichomonads, one of the two one-celled protozoans that are associated with periodontal disease, and amoebae, the other one-celled protozoan, white blood cells. Those are large cells comparatively, and you can see them quite easily, as well as red cells. Here are what spirochetes look like in drawings. There's an interesting parallel in the shape of white blood cells, or of uh, spirochetes, uh, with the pathogenicity of the sample in nascent biofilms that, that are just recently colonized the surface. The species that do best there are the spirochetes tend to be short and loosely coiled, like the ones at the bottom of the chart there. As the conditions become more and more profoundly anaerobic, 
they don't grow as well, but the species up the uh, list do. So in long-standing biofilms, you tend to get much thicker, much more tightly coiled and longer species of spirochetes than you do in early infections. So you can do something of a differential diagnosis of how long that biofilm has been there by the kinds of spirochetes that you see inside them. These are some other representations of the way they look. But we got even better things to show you here. We got movies. And the AV staff here has done a terrific job. These are showing up beautifully, even on the lower resolution projecting screen. Nothing that you see moving on the screen should be there in a patient who is periodontally healthy. And here you see just, well, the micro term is TNC, too numerous to count. The, the, these spirochetes are just plain filling the pocket. Here, you see the beginnings of what is called spirochetal pumping. The, the spirochetes are beginning to organize. They're beating in unison, taking clues from their neighbors as to when to move and when not to move, so they create a, a, a moving action. Here you see the same thing, highly magnified. Nothing is actually, see if I can stop this. Nothing is actually moving right to left across the screen. There, there, there's no actual movement of the species going across. What you're seeing is more analogous to a stadium wave, you know, they're all moving up and down at the same time or the wind blowing along a wheat field. So the synchronicity of the movement is creating a current flow within the biofilm and that's what you're seeing there. What cues these individual microorganisms to behave as a cooperative society? It's fascinating. Paul Kais uh, of NIH was the uh, NIDR was the uh, first person to describe this in the literature. These little groups of spirochetes that you see here, these are the remnants of white blood cells. This is the rule in microbiological observing. The white blood cells almost never go out and capture anything. It's extremely rare to see that. On the other hand, it's common to see groups of these spirochete thugs attacking white blood cells and destroying them. And that film's about over. This sample was made with a, with a little bit of an oil, so that pushed all the spirochetes, you know, down towards the bottom there, and it makes that coordinated motion on even easier to see. Yeast, I mentioned you can see those in samples, and here is what they look like on a microscope. We've got mother cells, daughter cells, and hyphae. Yeast are a pleomorphic organism. That means that they have two different observable forms. One is a little circular bug-like that, that is almost spore-like, and the other is a rapid growth phase where they put out these hyphae and uh, grow laterally. Oftentimes, you're looking at yeast in microscope samples, but they're very close in size and, and appearance sometimes to a red blood cell, so they're easy to confuse. Here's my personal favorite microorganism, Trichomonas aralis, just because these guys, they're fun. They just got character. I could watch these guys for, for hours. They, they're like pets. If you could grow one of these guys to be, you know, like the size of a collie or a German shepherd, you'd buy it as a pet. These guys are fun. Here's what they look like. You can see them in the center of the screen there. Most people's reaction is they look like mice, and they do a bit. You'll see it in, in a magnified view a little bit later. There's a bunch of them in this sample. Um, they have four enormous flagella, twice the length of their body, that, that search around or sense on one end of the organism. There you can see it. Uh, and a, what's called an undulating membrane that runs down one side of them. Never seen in health. We only see these in advanced cases of perio. That's enough. Come on, Oops, didn't mean to jump that far back. Amoebae, this is how they appear. These, of course, are single-celled animals, not bacteria, but another indicator of periodontal risk. We've noticed that they seem to have an affinity for uh, dead white blood cells. All of those round objects that you see within the body of, of the three amoebae that are on the screen there are dead white blood cells. 
So maybe their role is just the scavenger of the biofilms. I don't know. Here, of course, it's crawling through a very thick field of, of spider bees. Move on. White blood cells, of course, are the primary inflammatory cell. About 95% of the white blood cells in a peripocket will be uh, polymorphonuclear leukocytes. See very few of them in healthy people. TNC in people who have inflammation, of course. And this is what a white blood cell looks like. I would run the tape, but they don't move much. There really isn't much to see. They're static organisms. So to save time, we'll go on to uh, TNC pictures of them. In other words, almost every object you see here is a white blood cell. When you see the mass like that, uh, that that's prima facie evidence of periodontal disease. Almost doesn't matter what the offending organism is. Something is triggering inflammation in that pocket. With one exception, and you'll only see these in dental hygienists because they're the only ones who are so obsessive about their oral hygiene. The mechanical trauma associated with, you know, 15 times brushing a day and flossing damages the surface layer of the epithelium, and that triggers a, a release of bradykinin, which is busy going about the repair of the damage by making the capillaries more leaky, so uh, healing cells can come in and thrombocytes and start repairing that superficial damage. So typically in, in dental hygiene populations, we tend to see none of the microbial risk factors, but just tons of white blood cells. It's a very boring picture on them. I wish we could say the same for most dentists. Unfortunately, most dentists aren't in there as often as their hygienists are. Red blood cells, we can see those microscopically. There are no diagnostic significance. Uh, it, I mention them only because when people are taking samples and it looks red, they're afraid to make up the sample. Don't worry. At the microscopic level, this will just be another half dozen or so cells in the picture. They also give you ability to size things, though, because the seven uh, White red blood cells are seven microns in diameter, so from that you can estimate the size of anything else that you see. And that's, of course, the way they look like it. I will play the movie to catch up on time here. And we'll close with this little pop quiz. Does anybody want to hazard a guess as to what this particular microbe is? You can't see this with a microscope. This one is very small. You can only see it with an electron photomicrograph. Anyone want to hazard or ask? You know, don't be afraid. You'll be wrong. <laughs> okay. No one brave. I'll tell you. This is Helobacter pylorus. And the reason it's significant from a dental point of view, H. pylorus is the causal organism for ulcers. But where is the second largest reservoir of it in the body? The mouth. So you can get rid of uh, an ulcer infection by getting rid of H. pylori with a systemic. But if you don't also cure the periodontal microflora, you can easily get reinfected in the stomach because obviously what you swallow goes there first. So you may have the possibility of reducing ulcers as well by curing your patient of their periodontal problems. And I think that keeps me pretty much right on time here. Where do you get some of this stuff? Uh, microscopes and banana tests are available from Oratech cultures from the two labs that I described to you earlier. DNA tests, there are now two companies that offer that. One is Hain Diagnostics and a new kid on the block called Oral DNA Labs. They both offer those. Uh, again, uh, if you want copies of these, visit the IOMT website. If you want your own personal CD that has twice as much information on this, visit our booth in the exhibitors thing. Be happy to give you one. And that ends the presentation.